Welcome back to Solo Adventures! My name is Livy, and I'm here today with part two of my long-awaited series where I teach you how to make your own print-and-play games. So if you haven't watched my first video, I highly recommend that you go back and do so because that's where I go into depth with all of the tools and materials that I'm using. I won't be explaining too much about what I'm using in the tutorial going forward, so I think that first video might be helpful for you. Since the majority of print-and-play games that I build involve cards in some form or another, I thought that, that would be a good place to start. The two main methods that I use for making my cards are your typical traditional front and back printed single layer cards and also gutter fold style cards. I'll be going into how to construct both of these. There are of course other methods that I've seen people use for making print and play cards. Um, the most notable I would say is the very simple method of just printing out your cards on normal paper and sticking it in one of those card protector sleeves with just a, a normal playing card in the back for support. And that is a very quick, fast and easy way to make a print and play build. And in fact, I do that sometimes myself if I just want to try out a game and I'm not entirely sure if I want to put in the effort to make a finished version. The cards that I'm going to show you how to make look really nice, they're durable and very easy to shuffle. So in my opinion, this is the best way to make cards. So without any further ado, let's venture forth. So the first kind of card I'm going to show you how to make is just your standard dual sided variety. So to start out with, we have our PNP files printed out on 160 gram paper. And they're printed on both sides, front and back. Each of these sheets has six cards. Um, this is for the Skulls of Sedlik, which is not a solo game straight out of the box, but with a very simple, easy to make expansion, this is a soloable game. Upon printing these for this demonstration, I noticed that my printer is starting to get a little bit streaky because I'm getting low on a couple of colors as usual. I always seem to be low on colored ink, um, but that, that's okay because this is just for demonstration purposes only. So I'm going to tell you right now that the secret ingredient for making really excellent, beautiful uh, PNP games is patience. More than anything, I would say that the secret to my really nice looking cards is just patience and really taking my time to make sure that everything looks really nice and even and neat. So usually what I do before I actually start laminating is I... I load up all of my pages into the laminator foils so I can just laminate them one after another. Take care to make sure that everything is lined up properly and that you don't have any bits of fuzz or debris or bits of paper that are stuck inside of your foil because that will of course get stuck to your cards. The next thing we do is we heat up our laminator. So we're going to heat up the laminator until the light glows green. So I apologize because my laminator is a little bit noisy, um, but hopefully you can hear me fine. So remember how I told you that the main secret ingredient for my cards is patience? Well, that's true. The main ingredient is patience, but there is a second ingredient and that is heat. So... Um, let's just feed this through the laminator normally, and then I'll show you what I mean. So a lot of times when people are making laminated PNP cards, um, this is usually where they stop. Just when the cards come out of the laminator, um, people say, yeah, okay, that's good enough, and then they cut them out, and yeah, that'll make pretty fine laminated cards that should do pretty well. But to really improve the look, the gloss, um, the adhesion of the plastic, what we're going to do is we immediately feed it back through. So as soon as it comes out the first time, we put it back in immediately. And this is to help take advantage of the heat that we already have um, in the cardstock and in the plastic. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get as much heat as possible um, in the plastic foil to ensure the best adhesion possible to our paper. All right, so uh, yeah, here we have our laminated sheet, and we can already see um, how much the lamination does for improving the color. 
Um, as I said before, my printer was a bit streaky and the color was a bit irregular because I'm running out of cyan in my printer. Now we can see those bands of color a lot more strongly. Um, you can see it even better here on the back. Um, for some reason, the plastic um, adhering to this printed surface really helps those colors pop and makes them more vibrant. So yeah, you'll notice that the process of making the cards will actually make the images look a bit nicer. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to cut out the cards. And I have the benefit of this wonderful handy dandy paper trimmer. So this helps make my job a lot faster and more efficient. Um, but there's nothing wrong with using scissors as well. And um, actually sometimes I end up using both for the best precision. So um, we see these little dark lines here. This will help us cut out the cards. But what we want to do is we always want to be cutting our cards out from the back because the back is where we're going to be looking at the cards when we're shuffling. And it's most important that the backs look uniform. Um, it's okay if the fronts are a little bit off center, a little bit irregular, um, because this won't really impact our game. But just always remember, cut out from the back. We have our little black lines here to help us line up our cut. That's what I'm going to do, is just position them right in the center. And easy as that. In the case that you don't have a paper trimmer, um, what you can use is a ruler and a hobby knife. If you can help it, don't use a plastic ruler. Um, use the metal cork-backed ruler that I suggested in the previous video. Um, and that's just because if your blade is a little bit crooked, you might end up cutting into the plastic and everything gets jagged. It's just not so nice. Um, if that's all you have, then I guess you just have to use what you have and just very carefully line up your cut before you do it. I can't find my corkback ruler. Um, and in the case that I'm going to be doing this kind of cutting, I actually prefer using this quilting ruler. But it's basically the same kind of idea, is you just line it up and you can either use your hobby knife, uh, make sure it's very, very sharp, or you can even use a rotary cutter like this, um, just very simply moving it like so. This is really useful to have on hand for cutting thick cardboard, but you can also use it for thin cardstock as well. If you're using a paper trimmer and you want to make it just a little bit easier to line up, what you can do is you can cut this edge off here so that you can see these little black lines better. And this will help you um, line it up more easily. So once we've got our cards cut out, it's time to use the corner rounder. So I'm going to use my trusty Katamaro Pro and we are going to use the small corner rounder. So yeah, now you see these cards, they look pretty good. They have nice rounded corners and um, you can stop here, I guess, if you want to. This is, I think, where most people stop with the laminator method. Um, but if we look carefully at the cards, it's kind of hard to see in this light. Um, it's just a little bit wavy. There's a couple of small air bubbles that are trapped in here. Um, we can do better and we can make these cards more durable. So time to heat up the laminator again. The important thing to note is that um, after cutting out these cards, after laminating them, what we've done is we've basically broken the seal of the, of the lamination plastic. So these look pretty durable, but if we don't go through to seal these again, um, the plastic is going to start peeling, um, the edges are going to start kind of opening up, and these are just going to be harder to shuffle and have a much shorter life. 
So um, yeah, basically the next point is just going to take a little bit of patience and a little bit of time. And um, remember how I said that we're going to use our laminator just a little bit differently than it's recommended by the manufacturer? Um, this is one of my techniques that does something like this. Um, it's not too drastic. We're just going to be putting multiple cards in at one time to help speed up the process. And as soon as they're done, we just put them back in. Now what we want to do is we want to ensure that we've got a really good seal, so we're going to laminate them the horizontal way, and um, I'm touching them very carefully because they're extremely hot. When you run them through the laminator more than once, um, they get very, very hot, so be careful not to burn your fingers. So I do them twice that way. And while you do this, you might have a couple of air bubbles that pop up from being pressed in a couple of different directions. Don't panic, just keep putting them through. To finish, to make sure I've got a really good seal, I put them in diagonally. So if you're doing this right, they're going to be really hot when they come out and kind of malleable. So to help them keep their shape, you want to put something kind of heavy and flat on the top to make sure that when they cool, they cool um, nice and flat and smooth. After these are done cooling and they're nice and flat, if there's any kind of bend or anything to them, just put them under um, some books and just a little bit more weight if you need it. Um, but yeah, these are done. We have nice, beautiful, smooth, glossy laminated cards that shuffle pretty easily. So these are cards that I made in exactly the same way, using exactly the same method. As you can see, they, they shuffle pretty nicely. They're really smooth, pretty durable. And um, I'm sorry because my shuffling skills don't look very nice, but I'll do my best here. They shuffle just fine. So that's it for our standard um, duplex printed cards. Now let's get into the other most common method of making cards and that is gutter fold. So with the gutter fold card, um, instead of the pages coming out where you have all of the fronts on one side and the backs on the other, with gutter fold cards, you have the front and the back on the same side. And so basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be folding this paper in half like this, and we're going to have, in essence, a double thick card. Now, some people really prefer this method because it gives you the greatest precision when um, lining up the front and back, um, especially because even with a nice duplex printer, sometimes things are just a little bit off center. Um, it's not my favorite method because it takes more steps, um, and also the cards at the end are going to be thicker. So here we see 26 normal cards, and here are 26 gutter fold cards. Um, these are still perfectly fine though, and in some cases there are only files for the gutter fold method, so sometimes you just have to use this. Um, the cards are going to be a little bit stiffer, a little bit more snappy, and therefore a little bit harder to shuffle, at least for my small hands, but they're still perfectly fine and they are still perfectly durable and um, fun to use. So it's tempting with the gutter fold technique to just take this piece of paper and fold it in half and crease it, but um, there's ways that we can use to help make sure that this is a little bit more precise. So if you do paper craft, um, you'll be familiar with this technique, I think. It's called scoring. So as I said before, it's better if you can use a metal corkback ruler, but if you don't have one on hand, like uh, I can't seem to find mine at the moment, just a normal one is fine. We're not really going to be cutting, 
so that's perfectly okay in any case. What we're going to do is we're going to take just the tip of our knife and we're going to very lightly trace a line right down the middle. We're only going to be cutting about halfway through the paper. We're not cutting all the way through to the mat, just um, scoring a line. So in my case, I just kind of barely put pressure on it and just kind of drag it down the middle. Okay, you probably can't see it, but you can feel it if you roll your thumb over it. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to follow that score line and fold it in half. Now you can, of course, just use your fingers to do that. That's perfectly fine. Um, but if you want to get fancy, and if you're doing a lot of these cards, it might help to save your fingertips a little bit. I like to use my bone folder. So just crease a couple times like this. So now what we need to do is we need to adhere the front to the back. And this is where some spray adhesive really comes in handy. Um, that's definitely the most convenient, but not everybody has spray adhesive and it's a little bit expensive and using it indoors is kind of annoying. Um, so there's nothing wrong with using just a good old fashioned dependable glue stick. So um, make sure it is a glue stick. You don't want to use bottle glue because uh, the moisture will make it wrinkly and that's just unpleasant. So we're going to apply the glue stick liberally, smoothly though. We're going to try not to get little lumps of glue here and there. And apply everywhere cards will be touching because there's some places we're of course going to cut off and just to ensure really good coverage I do both sides get right as close up to the edge as you can might be a little bit messy so you might want to protect your workspace with some paper now we just oop, Got a little bit of fuzz in there. Let's move that out a bit. Folding from the center out. We don't want any air bubbles inside. We want just nice, flat, even adhesion. Smooth it a few times. I even use my bone folder to help distribute the glue. I find this really helps. It kind of smooshes the glue a bit flatter and helps spread it more evenly. All right. So now this is even more important than with the last method. We're going to want to put this under some heavy books or um, something else heavy for a while and wait until it dries. Sometimes I even use board game boxes and you can like put heavy stuff inside them if you want. But yeah, just the weight, the sheer heft of some board games is enough to ensure that your paper stays nice and flat. So we'll come back later when this is dry and we'll continue. All right, so a few hours later and it should be dry. I think it's pretty good. So then we're just going to slide it in a laminator foil. So if you're making a full deck of these, then generally what I do is I will put two of them side by side. So you can uh, laminate two of these strips of cards at once. But for the demonstration, I'm just doing one, so we'll just do it like this. And then as before, we'll just run it through the laminator. And then we'll run it through again.
So with this particular um, set of cards that we're making, I would not use the uh, paper trimmer because this little stripe of paper here is just too thin and I don't trust my blade to be sharp enough. So we are just going to cut this one out manually with scissors. And as always, we cut from the back. And the paper trimmer should be able to take it from here. And then as before, we just round the corners. Once the corners are rounded, we do as we did before, and we run the cards through the laminator a couple more times just to make sure they're really well sealed. We put them through the long way twice, or the short way, I guess, depending on your perspective. And then I do them diagonally. So these look pretty good. They're probably done. Um, if they're still really warm and um, feel like they might work, you can put them under something heavy. But since these are thicker than the last cards, I don't really feel the need in this case. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to check the edges to make sure that we have a really good adhesion. Because since we made these cards by gluing two sides together, sometimes they begin to peel around the edges. And these are glued really well. But um, if you have some trouble, if you have some edges that come open, what I do is I take a glue stick like this and I just run it around the edges like so. Mm, rub it in and then just kind of wipe it off like this. Um, your glue stick is probably going to be of the washable variety, so you can um, use a cloth, maybe even a very, very slightly damp one if you're having trouble, but this should help seal the edges better if you're having issues. But yeah, these are two finished gutterfold cards. And your final result will be something like this. So those are my basic methods for constructing cards. I hope that my tutorial was easy for you to follow, but if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will answer them. Now that you know how to make your own cards, there are actually quite a few print and play builds that you can make in their entirety. For example, my favorite PNP game of 2020 was Dungeon Flea, and that game is made up of nothing but cards. Button Shy Games also publishes a lot of PNP games that are also made up of just cards. For example, Food Chain Island, or the ever-popular Sprawlopolis. If you want to make every PNP out there though, of course you're going to have to be able to make a few other different kinds of components. Um, for example, tokens, which will be the subject of my next video. Print and play games are a fantastic and cost-effective hobby to get into, but I know a lot of people are intimidated by what they think is going to be a difficult process when it comes to actually building the games. So I hope you give my methods a try for yourself and see just how easy it is to make a gorgeous build. So what I want to know is, do you have any tips for constructing print and play cards? If you have them, then please leave them in the comments because I'm sure I'm not the only person who would be interested in reading them. Thank you so much for watching. I want to give a big thank you to my patrons who make this channel possible and who I love and adore, and an extra special big thanks to my heroic tier supporter, Joshua Jumbles. So until next time, my friends, stay adventurous.